I want to tell you about a new podcast called Amuse News. Publishing multiple days a week, Amuse News is your source for food news, interviews from around the food world, and more. On the show, we'll be engaging with food storytellers, from chefs to advocates to people working in the field, and many more. Find Amuse News wherever you get your podcasts. Amuse News is a destination for everyone who's looking for a new, insightful look into the world of food. Today's program is brought to you by Myriad Restaurant Group. For more information, visit myriadrestaurantgroup.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. We're a member-supported food radio network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. Join our hosts as they lead you through the world of craft brewing, behind the scenes of the restaurant industry, inside the battle over school food, and beyond. Find us at Heritage Radio Network. Org. Welcome to The Line. Before I introduce today's guest, I want to take a moment to ask you for your help. Uh, to help share ideas and strategy of how the hospitality industry can collectively make real change by using our influence. Obviously, everyone knows what's going on with the current administration. I'm sure you've been reading tons of news articles and, and uh, fo- fo- uh, following along. Um, I thought it was uh, extraordinary when uh, lawyers started showing up at airports and working around the clock using their professional expertise to solve a problem created by this administration. So that led me to uh, think about as how a small business owner in the hospitality industry, I'm a very small part of something massive, and hopefully all together we can make an impact. So I just wanted to share a couple facts real quick. There are over 1 million restaurants in the United States with 14 and a half million employees, which is 10% of the entire U.S. workforce. Uh, nine out of 10 restaurants have fewer than 50 employees. So that's a lot of power there that can be harnessed. So uh, beyond being just being good to your fellow humans, uh, since a restaurant is the world that I live and work in, I'm thinking about how we as people who interact and work in the industry can constructively come together and influence the the current administration. So if you've got ideas, if you've got strategies, uh, I would love to hear them so that we can share them collectively. If you have a website that you're looking at, that's great. Please share it. If you know someone working on projects that we can get involved in and support from, please share it. So how do you do that? You can tweet me at the Sussmans, or you can send an email to the line at heritageradionetwork.org, or you can tweet or post on Heritage Radio Network's Instagram. We want to compile some of these ideas and figure out how we can push forward. So uh, thanks for that. Keep the gears turning on those ideas. And now I want to introduce our guest today. It is Chef Marco Canora. Thanks for being here, Chef. Happy to be here. So you opened Hearth 12 years ago in Manhattan. It's received reviews twice from the New York Times in 2004 and 2013, both very nice glowing reviews. The restaurant has been nominated as an outstanding restaurant from the James Beard Foundation, and you were nominated in 2016 for the James Beard Award Best Chef New York City. In addition to Hearth, you own Brodo, which focuses on bone broth, which we'll talk about, as well as Zadie's Oyster Room, which... Sounds pretty self-explanatory. Those are both in Manhattan. Uh, thanks for being here. It's, I'm happy to be here. So before we dig into your personal history, history I want to talk uh, just briefly about the current administration, since it's sort of on everyone's minds. Mm-hmm. You've got several businesses in New York City. Um, I want to hear first, you know, how are you feeling? And also, are you hearing anything from your employees? And then if you can share anything positive uh, that you're feeling. I know it's like a, a real negative time, but if there's Oof. anything positive that you're feeling that you can um, share with the listeners. Well, I feel very positive about the fact that I live in the place that I live because I feel like I'm surrounded by people that kind of have the liberal views that I have, Um, you know, especially at work. You know, there's such a sense of community right now. And I get a sense that our staff and my management team and myself, we're all incredibly grateful for the little kind of world and family that we work in every day. And we're constantly trying to do things uh, to help the bigger, broader cause. Um, you know, I was very proud of my management staff a couple of weeks ago. They came up with this idea to do a, you know, a, a create a special cocktail and figure out how much it costs and give all the rest of the money to Planned Parenthood. And now that has turned into a program where every month we come up with a new cocktail and we come up with a new 
kind of group that we want to support. Um, and we're constantly trying to generate revenue and awareness to donate to these causes. So it really kind of brought the management team together. Um, you know, our staff has always been incredibly diverse. Um, one of the greatest things about New York City is its diversity, and we're really, really proud of that. Um, you know, we have safety pins going all over the restaurant, which has been cool to let everybody know it's the, the safe zone. I really love the I really love this whole notion of the safety pin. I think it's really kind of cool. It's very proudly on our menu board out on First Avenue. Did you get those from somewhere? Did you have them made? Is it an organization no. that supplies? A- no, <laughs> we just went and bought a bunch of safety pins okay. and like, have them scattered about. And we have a beautiful image of a safety pin printed on nice paper that's in our menu board. Um, just to make sure the world knows that it's that's, just here's a safety pin. This is a safe place. Exactly. Okay. And I think that that's important. Um, and you know we're partnering with the International Refugee Committee, and we're going to do a fundraiser um, in March with them to help them raise some money for all the great work that they do. Um, so you know it's nice to see everybody engaged again and active. So it, you know that's the positive. That's the positive view. Yeah, it seems that uh, as a place where people gather, you know, people come to your spot uh, to eat by doing just some very small things by that are forward facing to your customers. You can show them that not only do we care about the meal that you're going to have and are we very yep. serious about what we're putting on the table and the contents of it, but now there's sort of an added responsibility to even go a step further as a restaurant Absolutely. and say uh, – Yep, we care about sourcing. Yep, we care about our, uh, you know, our employees. But it even goes a step further. We care about the community at large and Absolutely. like what happens beyond the doors of our of our restaurant. A hundred percent. You know, I was raised in the Danny Meyer school of thought. So, you know, I spent I spent seven really great years at Gramercy Tavern, and you know that community aspect is such a huge part of of the foundation that Danny built his empire off of. So it's always been, you know, it's always been meaningful and important to us. Let's talk a little bit about Gramercy Tavern. So I know that you started there um, when Tom Calicchio was the chef. Yep. And uh, you started off as a line cook. And, I, yeah. And uh, what was what was that like to come into that environment? Was Gramercy was it new when you started? Was it already established as sort of the behemoth in the culinary landscape <clears throat> that it is? So I got there a year and a half after it opened. So it was relatively new. Um, and you know, how was it? It was, I I mean, I had never worked in a serious New York city kitchen. Um, and in the early nineties, you know, the environment was a little bit more, it was a little bit tougher of an environment in the sense that, you know, New York city was the place to cook if you were really serious about cooking. And there was huge competition to get into the good restaurants and, you know, the sous chef and the, and the chef de cuisine, you know, they were very quick to show you the stack of resumes in the office. Um, so there was like... You are expendable. Yeah. It was really, you know, it was... That was always there. And, and it really created an environment where, you know, and I was young and I was new and I, I hadn't, you know, I didn't have the chops. And so it really drove me to, to work really hard. And, and um, you know, my, my first couple of trails, trails there was like, I was scared shitless. I mean, uh, there was the sous chef there who had this big, huge beard and he was chewing on a big piece of dip and like, he was like screaming on the, on the pass and his like face was all rashed out. Um, Payson was his name. And, um, I mean, that guy scared the shit out of me. He was like out of a nightmare and he was, he was very type A and very aggressive and, and it was a very competitive environment, and I had never seen, you know, a high-level New York City restaurant doing 230 plus covers a night. And it's a, it's an intense game. The thing that's uh, sort of shocking to me about Gramercy, I, I actually put in my notes. I, I wrote it was it's the diehard of restaurants because it's like it was. That movie is was amazing when it came out. It still holds up. <laughs> it still holds up somehow. I was trying to look for sort of a pop culture right. uh, comparison. It's like I've been to, I've been lucky enough to go to Gramercy a couple times. Mm-hmm. I find that every time I go there, it is exceptional. It's yep. always fantastic from the service on up to the food. But in the realm of New York City restaurants, it's a dinosaur. It's been around for forever. Yeah, over and, twenty years. And over twenty years, and yet somehow it is still both 
timelessly classic and mm-hmm. also very relevant at the same time. Yep. I'm not going to describe your restaurant as a dinosaur, but it's been around for a really long time. Yeah, 13 years. Which is a, an amazing accomplishment. So I think it's very fair to group them together as these restaurants that have sort of transcended. You know, they, mm-hmm. they've um, escaped the confines of being like a trendy spot that doesn't that doesn't exist anymore, right? So yep. how did you, maybe what were your takeaways from Gramercy or being in the Danny Meyer empire that you've implemented at Hearth that have allowed you to exist for so long in a competitive yeah. environment? Right. Well, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, I, <laughs> it's funny. It's like I've been trying to figure out the answers for 20 years, you know, and like, you know, why why do some restaurants, you know, have a magic dust that makes them work and other restaurants that – you know, seemingly do everything right, can't make it work. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's really been a mystery. And I certainly have spent endless hours thinking about that. Um, because, you know, there was certainly some really tough years at hearth. Um, and God, I wish I had some like crazy mastery, uh, you know, answer to this. I, I, I really don't, but I, I'd like, you know, I'm kind of an idealist and a romantic. And I'd like to think that, um, at the end of it, you know, there's something about, there's something about consistency and focus that you have to do day in and day out that nobody really wants to hear about that story because it's not easy. And I think, you know, and and also some of the core values that I was taught from my Tom Colicchio, Danny Meyer years, you know, values that we alluded to earlier about community and, and making sure that you're a part of the community um, and making sure that you really take care of your staff and that it's genuine. Um, you know, I, ultimately, I think, like, there needs to be an honesty and a love and and something genuine about it, and, like, you can't fake it. So, you know, I feel like the hospitality industry, if you're a small mom-and-pop player in the hospitality space, it needs to be really genuine and it needs to be heartfelt. And I think that if people feel that it's real and that it's connected to people, um, I I feel like that that is a real, you know, it's a, it adds a lot of value and people recognize it. And then your customers want to support that. And I, I think now more than ever, because I think that people are craving real human connection and the fact that my staff is truly happy to come to work and be a part of what we're doing at Hearth, I feel like that that resonates through the customer experience and that ultimately that's what they, that's what they want to support. I want to talk about the sort of massive change that, under, that you undertook at Hearth, which was uh, after many, many years of being open, you uh, – Made a huge menu change. Yep. Uh, you closed for a week. You ten days. You, you, <laughs> you changed uh, the direction. You came up with a mantra for the restaurant, which may have existed beforehand, but now is actually physically printed on the menus, so mm-hmm. that you can uh, read about what your uh, ideals are and what you're in pursuit of at the restaurant. Can you please talk about? why you decided to make that change and also without having to go through all 13 is there one that really sticks out to you as something that uh is a critical linchpin of the the new incarnation of your restaurant sure um you know so you hit that you know you 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 referred to the dinosaur thing right and nobody wants to be you know nobody wants to be the old lady in grandma jeans right so you know, I, I felt, and, and I had recently uh, separated with my business partner, Paul Greco, um, and Brodo had launched a year earlier, and we had just gone through our 10-year, and, you know, I was trying to figure out ways to remain relevant um, and to be in the conversation. And, you know, in this town of new and noteworthy, it's very easy to fall off of that list. Um, and I thought it was imperative for us to have some kind of rebirth and, 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 you know, a, a second act. Um, so I wanted it to kind of align with Brodo in terms of the platform that it was launched off of. There was a health and wellness aspect to Brodo that related to me personally. And I, I really saw, a, uh, I saw an opportunity in the restaurant space that nobody was really trying to 
Um, nobody was trying to take advantage of this opportunity, um, especially in like, I don't want to call it fine dining, but like a full service dining establishment. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of fast casual and there's a lot of, uh, CPG products out there that are jumping on the health and wellness bandwagon, but I, I really didn't see it happening in the restaurant space that I existed in. Um, so, and it made, it made perfect sense because I had launched Brodo a year and a half earlier, and a lot of the people coming to that window were the tribe that I kind of wanted to talk to through Hearth as well. Um, and so, you know, we, it, was like, it was a brand identity thing. It was a refresh on the interior thing. We also lost the app and entree model, and we went to like a, I don't want to call it small plates, but like more of a categorized menu where people were encouraged to eat more convivially. Um, not like this court, you know, we opened and we were so serious and it was like, you know, amuse bouche and first course and mid course and entree. And it was like all this like formal service and structure. And like, I really, I just wanted to throw that all away because I just felt like it wasn't working on so many levels. Um, so we did it. And, it, you know, a lot of it was encouraging the staff and getting them on board. And there was this big motivational piece of like selling it to my staff to get them on board. And, and it was, you know, 2016 was like one of the best years we ever had. The vibe in the restaurant and the staff, it was so positive. People were so responsive. And I just, I feel, I feel so lucky that I had the support that I had. And, and it really worked. And, you know, to the new, you know, we did an infographic on the back because I felt like I really wanted to message this stuff. And um, I guess if I had to distill it down to like one idea, it's that, you know, of course the food is going to be delicious and of course it's going to be, um, you know, there's going to be great service and great hospitality and delicious food. Like that's a given, that's a starting point. But I really wanted to focus on the concept of nutrient density. And I really wanted to focus on the concept of like, when you finish, when you're finished eating dinner here, you're going to feel really good. Um, you're going to feel physically good and mentally good because you just ate really wholesome uh, food and you didn't eat crappy trans fats and you didn't eat crappy processed sugar or crappy processed flour. And we really made a huge effort and turned the volume up on this notion of like making sure everything we serve our guest is of the highest quality and full of nutrients. And like, I love the nutrient density conversation. I'm glad that you, that you said that because I wrote down two things when I looked at your menu last time I was there and I, so I wrote down and circled fat is a major important food group, which seems yes. to be this thing that people are terrified of talking about. They're yeah. like, just strip the fat out, strip any type of, you know, don't give me butter. Don't give yeah. me oil, which uh, I believe is uh, and you believe is the wrong direction to go in as obviously you you believe it's a major important food group. And then the other thing that I thought was really great is this and I'm going to read it. When the cheetah takes down the gazelle, the first and only thing it eats are the guts. It realizes where the biggest bang for the buck lies in terms of nutrients. We could learn from nature. So – First off, it is very <laughs> uncommon for a restaurant to want to elicit the image of a gazelle being torn to shreds and being <laughs> eaten by a cheetah. I don't usually think of that right before I sit down to eat, but it is so true. What you're talking about is that, um, look, we're humans, and the way that we're eating is not really mimicking what is a proper way to eat according to how nature is organized, right? Mm -hmm. And that if you're going to eat meat, let's talk about – eating meat responsibly. And if you're going to eat fat, let's talk about eating fat responsibly, which is so cool because your menu is structured in this way that basically I feel like it gives me an invitation to be like, you want to eat that? All right. You can eat that. It's okay. <laughs> right. Like you want pasta? Like, let me tell you why you can eat my pasta. You yes. know? So, um, it's so not deprivation based. Yeah. And, and, and so essentially when you, when you crafted this menu, um, when you were selling it through to your, uh, you know, your employees, what did your regulars think about this big change? Did people notice or right. did they just simply say like, well, the food is still good. So, so I, you know, I, I bantered this idea around my brain for a couple, three years. And, you know, there was a lot of, there were a lot of concerns. One that you just mentioned, like the regulars, you know, who have grown to know and love us <clears throat> for who we were. And then all of a sudden, I was going to shake it up and turn it on its ass. And I really had concerns about losing some of the support from my regulars. Um, 
Uh, so, you know, I made sure, like I was, we talked at length about it with the staff and, and how to kind of manage it in a way that wouldn't kind of do that to our regular. So, you know, we had, for instance, veal and ricotta meatballs was a signature dish of Hearth Restaurant forever. People loved them. And there was no way I can get rid of them. However, you can't find really clean veal in the quantities that I needed, right? Like nobody's growing, nobody's growing grass-fed veal right now because it's like what they call rose veal. And it's while it's big in Italy and throughout Europe, everybody in America wants the super pale, penned, milk-fed with powdered milk veal. And it didn't really fit the profile of the clean animals that I wanted. Um, so... We basically turned them in, you know, we, we got grass-fed beef instead, and we did beef and ricotta meatballs. So I didn't really, you know, the signature dishes didn't go away. I just kind of amped them up. So rather than buying all-purpose white flour uh, to make my extruded pasta, you know, we bought a mill, and we started buying local grains and making our own flour. So it's not that the, the rigatoni with pork ragu went away. It's just that I wasn't using commodities, all-purpose flour, and I was using milled whole grain local flour. And in my mind, I was like, who would be upset about that, right? Like, Totally. So, you know, I think that, I think we did a good job at telling the story and, and, and having a, a respect for who we were and what we were serving and not changing it too much where we pissed off our, our regulars. And so, of course, you know, it's a wonderful thing to change the menu and to, uh, source more responsibly, but it is in fact a business. And I'm curious from the business perspective, <laughs> what does that mean about costs on your side right. by buying a mill, buying local, switching yep. everything over to sustainable grass fed? Yeah. And if you did in fact raise your prices or pass that on to the consumer, how do you find that balancing act? A lot of people that listen to Heritage are, are in the business, mm -hmm. business owners, they're constantly thinking about Yep. price point versus you know what's palatable which is yep. what's profitable which are often not the same thing at all boy that was a huge piece of the anxiety as well um because you know the old app and entree format was not serving me because my entrees were starting to pop 40 bucks and that was like the death nail in my mind i was like you know i'm not gonna you know in the east village like I'm not going to fill my seats if I have to start popping 20 on apps and popping 40 on entrees. And I wasn't willing to kind of use crappy chicken or commodities vegetables. Like we were built on the green market and clean meat and all of these things. And it was a real problem. Um, and so, you know, we kind of, you know, with the changing to categories and it was a play between portion size, right? So I was thinking in my mind, like, if you, if you get rid of app, the, if you get rid of the heading of appetizer and get rid of the heading of entree, all of a sudden you're just talking about a plate of food. And if you're talking about a plate of food, $21 is a great number. And $24 is a great number for a plate of food. But if you call it an appetizer you're like, oh, shit, that's really expensive, right? Or, you know, so it was really, you know, and, and I was fascinated by this because so much of menu design and pricing, it's such a psychological game, right? And, and so the new menu looked like we reduced all of our pricing because I didn't have anything at 36 or $38 other than the dishes for two, which served two to four I wrote on the menu. So there was perceived value. So in a lot of ways, like it was this play between losing the headings, portion size, um, and that's how we managed that problem. Because listen, we went, we only use 100% grass-fed butter now. No more, no more commodities butter. We're only using, you know, we mill like 80% of the flour we use, we mill ourselves. And whatever else, it's, orga it's now, if we have to buy a, a packaged flour, it's organic. Um, all the sugars are, are like date-based sugars or unprocessed sugars that end up costing a lot more money. So we added a lot of cost on the cost side of things. And we had to manage that with, you know, the new menu format and the portion sizing and the pricing. So in a lot of ways, like 
a lot of our apps that we would have charged $18 for, we added cost to them, but now we charge $21 or $22. And again, like by not calling it an app and thinking of it as this is just a plate of food, like every item on our menu is just a plate of food. And if we could serve plates of food between, you know, $9 for some of the – 7 for some of the bread things – and, you know, the majority of them are in the 18 to 26 range, then we look like an approachable restaurant. We're going to take a quick break. We're here talking with Chef Marco Canora. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about his mother and his other restaurants as well. <laughs> Stay with us here on Heritage Radio. We're proud to count the Myriad Restaurant Group as a business member of the Heritage Radio Network. Created by renowned restaurateur Drew Nieperent, Myriad consists of a diverse roster of restaurants, each one unique and memorable. Delicious food, excellent service, and genuine value are at the core of Myriad's storied history. Tribeca Grill, celebrating its 25th anniversary, helped define the Tribeca neighborhood and is the perennial winner of the Wine Spectator's Grand Award. Nobu New York has innovated new style Japanese cuisine for over 20 years, now joined by Nobu Next Door and Nobu 57, cooking Nobu's revered signature dishes. Batard, serving modern European cuisine, was named the best new restaurant of 2014 by Pete Wells in the New York Times and best new restaurant in America for 2015 by the James Beard Foundation, as well as earning a Michelin star. Myriad also serves up great ballpark dining at the Acela Club at City Field and tasty burgers at the Daily Burger at Madison Square Garden. The common thread is to be a good citizen in the communities they serve through the support of numerous charitable organizations. For more information, visit myriadrestaurantgroup.com. Welcome back to The Line here with Chef Marco Canora, owner of Hearth Restaurant. Uh, Chef, I wanted to ask you about your earliest influences. Mm. So I want to know about your family. Your family is originally from Lucca, Italy. Yep. So did, what, did, what was the kitchen like growing up? Did you so, grow up always, always being involved with food? I did. I was a very lucky kid in terms of, you know, what I was surrounded with in terms of food. Um, I grew up upstate New York in a tiny town called Milton, New York, um, in the Hudson Valley. And, you know, my mom kind of came to this country when she was 18 or 19 years old. Um, and, you know, this is in like the early 70s growing up in Milton. Uh, we had a huge garden. We had a, we had a home on, on the Hudson River. And my mom had a huge garden uh, that was a part, you know, it was a great part of my youth and growing up, like being in the garden and weeding the garden and picking vegetables and watching them grow. Um, we had tons of flowers as well. And um, she was very, very active outside in the dirt, in the garden. And that was that was huge. I mean, we would, you know, on a summer night, she would go out and pick zucchinis and pick zucchini flowers and pick basil and whip up a tremendously delicious zucchini frittata for dinner with a, a salad um, from lettuces in the garden. And, you know, I kind of grew up eating that clean food right from the garden, which was, um, you know, I think back at that and think, man, I was such a lucky kid to have that. So your normal was unlike most normal Oof, kids upbringing. God. You know, you don't know it as a kid, right? right? You just think that this is the normal. This is but, what I eat. And then you go over to looking, someone else's house and they're doing, yeah, you know, um, microwavable. Chicken, <laughs> round chicken patty things that were fr frozen, you know. Right. And so do you have any really, do you have a specific early memory where you thought this may be my career choice? Was there a, like a job that you had in high school or something that really led you to believe that it might be something you could still be doing today? Yeah, like I'm definitely, you know, I have the lifer story. You know, mm -hmm. my first job at 16 years old was as a dishwasher at the local restaurant. Uh -huh. And and I, you know, I, I literally caught the bug, as they say, and I, I just loved it. I loved the energy of the kitchen. I love that it was not, you know, that I worked on weekends and nights. 
Um, and it was just, it spoke to me. I thought that the chef was the coolest guy I had ever met, you know, like slicing up big prime ribs and, you know, just fire and sharp knives and, you know, food, great food and meat and like the energy. And it was just, you know, I, I, I absolutely caught the bug and I strayed out of the restaurant business for a couple of years and worked in the music industry. Um, but I, I quickly got sucked back. How did you end up in Italy? And what did that mean to your career from an influential standpoint? Um, you know, Danny helped me get a stage at Chabreo in Florence. And I went there for around three months um, and worked worked with him in Florence. Um, but, you know, my I, I had been, you know, I got married in Italy and my mom was born and raised in Italy. She has five brothers in Italy. So... And I was doing cooking classes in Italy. So I, I find my, my way back to Italy often. Um, and, you know, like I, I feel, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a deep connection I have to that part of the world. Like, there, you know, there's history there and it's palpable when I go there. And I really, I really, I feel it when I'm there. Do you think that for the most part... Um the, what you do at your restaurants is specifically influenced by, is it deeply rooted in technique that you learned here? Or do you give a lot of the credit back to things that you really learned in Italy? Or is it a, is it a, just a specific blend of the two? Yeah, I think it's a real blend, you know, like the, the Gramercy Tavern years, like it was a very French based kitchen and the fat in that kitchen was butter and mm -hmm. boy, we use so much butter. Um, you know, the fat that we use at Hearth for the last 13 years has been, it's an olive oil based kitchen. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really kind of funny, like when you think about it, like I really, I really think that that's a, that, that's a defining aspect of what kind of kitchen you run. It's the fat that you use. It's like, are you an olive oil kitchen or are you a butter kitchen? And that, that will help you trace back to where your food is born from. Well, it also has to do with building flavors, right? I mean, if you're going to start off with fat, you're um, with with a butter fat, you're immediately lending yourself to be a heavier dish. It's the yeah, for the, sure. The construction of it is just going to go in that direction, right? So right. Well, yeah, yeah, and and further to that point, it's just like all cooking starts with fat. I mean, fat fat is the vehicle to spread flavor throughout whatever it is you cook. So, regardless, you know, and, and I have a dream one day to do a a cookbook called Sofritos of the World because like if you look at you know if you look at any culture around the world there is everything starts with something in fat flavors in fat and you know in Tuscany it's minced carrot celery and onion and in in the far east you know you have ginger scallion and garlic and you could kind of through that lens you could kind of look at every culture around the world um, and it's kind of interesting because all cooking is kind of is the same, really. So let's talk about bone fat. Let's talk about fat, Animal from, fat. from roasting bones yep. and then pouring water over it and making a stock. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> how did that's another commonality how, in every culture in the world? How did uh, broth become such a central element of your life and now of your now of your professional career? Right. Well, um, you know, as a as a professional chef. I, I often say that it's broth is like salt and pepper in a professional kitchen. I mean, you need you need a good broth if you're gonna if you're gonna you know it's it's an essential element of cooking. Um, so I've always been around it, and you know I grew up on, on special holiday occasions. We'd always make a big pot of broth, um, usually for just a broth based first course soup. Um, and so I've always been around it. You know, at Gramercy we had two big kettles that were going 24 seven and we produced and went through so much broth. Um, there was a lot of sauce making there. Um, so it's not a, it's not a new thing by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and you know, part of this notion of like remaining a viable business, there, there came a time where I renewed my lease at hearth and you know, the rent went up a lot and there was this window that was on first Avenue. And I had always thought, It'd be cool to sell something out of it. And then there was a real fire put under my ass when my rent went up. And then I just was like, you know, this can, this can no longer just be an idea that I had. And I had to execute on something to generate another revenue stream. 
Um, and I fell upon this idea of broth in a cup. Um, and, you know, I really bootstrapped it together and it kind of, it was, it was good timing and, um, it kind of went off the rails and now it's like a hundred, it's almost a hundred percent of my focus trying to grow Brodo into something. So you have a secondary location that is a standalone location now, correct? Yeah. We just opened our brick and mortar at 496 Hudson in the West Village. It's a little 300 square foot shop that you could actually walk into. And so for people who haven't been there yet and are, and are thinking that this is an actual rest, you know, it's a, it doesn't not have, a restaurant. It doesn't have salads and an entree. No. It is broth in a cup. Yep. And you have how many varieties now? So we, have, we offer four broths mm-hmm. and 20-some-odd add-ins. And so obviously a lot of permutations, but everything does come in a, what, a 16 or a 12-ounce cup, basically? Yep, 10 or 16-ounce cup with a sip lid, just like coffee. And so is your hope with this that it can be... Did you envision this as a meal substitute? Is it a snack? Is it you don't care how people use it? What do you think Brodo is to a from a consumer? Well, Obviously, it's delicious. But beyond that, like, what does it mean to a consumer? Right. Well, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I mean, uh, some people absolutely use it as a meal replacement, and especially with the addition of fat because fat is so caloric. Um, so you could take something that is like 70 or 80 calories and you could turn it into something that is closer to 200 calories. And then it starts feeling very much like meal replacement, you know, and uh, some people drink it as like a functional beverage because they love the health benefits. Others drink it because it's really delicious and tasty and different. Others drink it because they don't want to eat lunch and they're trying to, you know, kind of minimize their caloric intake. Um, You know, I try to spend a lot of time customer facing and learning about our, our customer Um, Because I feel like that's kind of uh, an essential part of growing this properly. Um, And it's pretty fascinating. Like people, people do it for all kinds of reasons. When I first had it, when I first walked by and saw it, my first thought was, well, there's going to be about a thousand of these. And I, <laughs> <laughs> you think? Damn, what a, wish I would have thought about putting soup in a cup. I right, love that. Um, right. And, you know, with your first brick and mortar location, um, Brodo, as much as it is really coming from you and coming from your heart, it is a concept that is stampable. I mean, there could be many of them. Basically, you know, it follows a recipe and you put broth in a, in a cup with toppings. Um, as you look at your, we'll call it a portfolio of businesses, as we, as we look at the places that you run, you have a, a standalone restaurant, which uh, maybe you disagree, can never be duplicated. It is very much... Yeah, it's the mothership, own, we it's, call it. It's, uh, so the mothership is its own entity. And now you sort of are on the cusp of a um, an idea that could have multiple, multiple locations. How does that make you feel as a chef who's kind of simultaneously running along two tracks? Um, it's, you know, it, it's really exciting. And one of the things that I loved about Brodo, you know, coming from, you know, being a working chef at hearth for so many years – and the complexity of that and the amount of balls that you juggle and, you know, when you feed when you feed 200 people on a busy night and offer them a menu with 35 things on it and each one of those things has, like, you know, two or three or four or five or six ingredients, like, it's a massive undertaking, right? And, like, you're cooking everything a la minute and, you know, I mean, you're a restaurant guy it's a lot of balls in the air and every day you come in and you start over and it's, it's complicated and it's challenging and there's so much room for error. And the thing that, you know, the thing that got me really excited about Brodo is that, you know, I could make a big batch of stock and I could season this big vat of stock properly. And then I hold it hot and like, it just removes, you know, it's just like you put it into a cup and there's something so gratifying as a guy who is like, you know, banged his head against the wall to try to make every dish every night in a restaurant for 13 years great. And all the challenges that you understand go along with that. There's, there's such a, you know, it's, it's just so exciting to be able to like do something a little bit easier. 
yeah, and, and know and, that it's going to be great every time. And the and it's sort of a blessing that it's incredibly consistent, and that yes. you can deliver it to the consumer in a very easy way. Oh, you're not a, you're not doing a four pan pickup of like some entree, which is gratifying right. for the consumer, but in the same way, like who doesn't like a nice right. little cup of soup? So you know, having said that, there's an ease to that piece for sure compared to a restaurant, but. You know, one of the things I've learned is that you give up, you know, you have other challenges, right? So, uh, you know, what I'm learning about business in general and just trying to, like, make, you know, make a viable, profitable business that's able to grow and acquire staff is that, you know what, no matter, no matter what it is, it's, it's, not, it's not a walk in the park. And there's always challenges, whether it's staffing challenges or product challenges and and that's part of the game is is learning is learning how to kind of solve problems when um i my family was in town we came to your restaurant and my brother and i my brother's a uh, restaurant guy as well we own our restaurant together and we're sitting at the table with his wife who for many years worked front of house and you were working in the room and you were touching tables and you were running food and yep. so i bring that up for two reasons number one um we were shocked and that kind of made us sad. And so let me explain that. We okay. were shocked because you were working the room and you weren't in whites. You were running food and it looked like you were having a great time. We were like, wow, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. He really looks like he's having a great time in his restaurant. And we were saddened and shocked by the fact that, like we'd really never seen that anywhere else in, in New York. Like a chef who has a lot of acclaim who's just being in his spot and, and loving it. Yep. And so – I assume that it wasn't always like that and that you have now reached a point where like you're really sort of loving what's happening at hearth and you feel really satisfied by what's happening there. I want to know like um, was the changing point for you when you changed the menu specifically at year 10? Like was it a struggle until then and also is it a struggle now and you've just become more mature? I'm just curious about like where is your head at now right. 12 years in where you are really like – it seemed like you were just incredibly content being in your, in your own skin and in your right. own restaurant. <laughs> um, and, and I think a lot of people that are agonizing over the day-to-day -day are – hoping that they'll maybe get there one day. Yep. Um, and I want to know, like, if you feel like you've gotten there, how did you, how did you get to that point mentally? Wow. Well, that's, that's a pretty deep question, Eli. <laughs> um, and I could, I could go on and on. Um, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with, like, generally growing up. Um, and, you know, there were some really, really tough years where, you know, it wasn't the case and it was like, it felt more pained and it was more of a struggle and I was, there was like, it was more aggression and unhappiness and maybe even anger through some of the tougher years. Um, but to get to the other side of the tough years and to kind of, you know, you know, the separation with Paul was not like a super negative thing. Like we both, it was very amenable and we both agreed we wanted to do it, but there was a, you know, once we got on the other side of that and I was able to kind of turn Hearth into really my vision and my restaurant and not have it be a collaborative effort, there was, it was really gratifying and it felt really good. And, you know, launching Brodo and reinventing Hearth um, and getting to the other side of the tough years of year, you know, like year six and seven and eight and nine – uh, in the life of a restaurant in New York, like those are tough fucking years, you know, like nobody gives a shit about you anymore. And you see the cover counts go down and down and down and down and down. And there it's anxiety and you're, you know, you're cutting and you're doing more with less. And it's just, so th those were really tough years. And I am incredibly grateful that I made it to the other side. And I got to tell you, like back to the beginning of this, like there, there's a genuine joy and love I have for the family at hearth that I have. Um, and I think that that's critical to success. Like there has to be, you know, like I, you know, like you said, I was touching tables or whatever. I love being at my restaurant. I really do. And I love my team there and it, it feels like home and I'm incredibly proud of it of, you know, the food we're serving, of the people I have, and, and they're all, 
they're all thriving and I've really stepped away and I'm not like, I'm not in the trenches like I was for a lot of years. And it's just, I, it feels really good. I don't know what else to say. Jeff, thanks so much for being here. Uh, and sharing your story. Everyone, uh, please visit his restaurants. If you can just give a quick shout out to where they're located really quickly. Uh, so Hearth Restaurant is on the corner of 1st Avenue and 12th Street. Uh, Zadie's Oyster Room, which is a cool little spot, is down the street on 12th between A and 1st. And then our, our brick and mortar Brodo shop is um, 496 Hudson. Awesome. We're looking forward to having you back after you open your 10th location of, <laughs> Thanks, of Brodo in Manhattan. Everyone, you can check out this episode and many more episodes like it by going to heritageradionetwork.org. There's over 10,000 episodes for you to check out. You can download them all. And remember, join us every week here at 11 a.m. for The Line on Heritage Radio. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Are you hungry? Well, you're in luck. Meet and Three is back for season 16. I'm Taylor Early, and we've got a whole new batch of reporters I am so excited to introduce you to. Hi, Hi there. I'm Elizabeth Fisher. Asha McElroy. Sam Girardi. Jessica Gingrich. Hannah from Wisconsin. I'm a swing dancing audio engineer. I am a future registered dietitian nutritionist. I'm from New York and I love rice and beans. My favorite food of all time is a shrimp burrito. I love watermelon. We've also got a bonus podcast for you called Behind the Internship. Three of our reporters will take you along to show how they develop stories for this very show, Meet and Three. Hi, I'm Danielle Flitter, a plant-based chef from Philadelphia, living in Mexico City. I'm Sophia Hooper. I'm a bartender based in Portland, Maine. My name is Addison Austin Liu. I am a chef and food journalist from Salt Lake City, Utah, and my favorite food is Peruvian. Rice and beans. Hand-drawn noodle soup. So tune in to enjoy a square meal for your ears. And I hope you saved a little room for dessert. 